years, I believe science might offer an answer to the curse of the Bambino. Why someone took so long to hire that guy is beyond me. Anybody who's not tearing their team down right now and rebuilding it using your model, they're dinosaurs. One of the great things about money is it, it buys a lot of things. One of which is the luxury to disregard what baseball likes, doesn't like, what baseball thinks, doesn't think. <laughs> This is threatening, not just a way of doing business, but, it's, but in their minds, it's threatening the game. How can you not be romantic about baseball? All right. Welcome to another Baseball Ops podcast with Top V. We've got, once again, Zinger in the house. How's it going, Zinger? What's up, everybody? And we've got special guests today. We've had them on before. Angel Lugo. Thanks for being here, Angel. Hey, thanks for having me, Brent. All right. So this is pretty exciting. I I, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm more of a... Uh, a consultant in all this, but <laughs> it's pretty exciting having two guys that uh, we're, we're all a part of that are going to be in potentially first round draft picks picks this year. So I think this is cool. And I, I wanted to, that's why I want to do the podcast to have these two coaches here uh, and, and kind of talk about uh, how they've been developing these guys uh, to, to the, you know, such high status going into the MLB draft. And, um, you know, kind of the secrets behind it, you know, and what kind of athletes these guys are and what it takes. And then going into, um, you know, everything that we do uh, amongst all of us here. And, and we share a lot of, obviously, similarities and in, in, in mindset and, and approach here. So I think this is going to be a good kind of roundtable discussion here. So let's start with uh, Angel, since we know a lot about Zinger and, and uh, Matthew Libertor, who's potentially, I think, Major League Baseball's got him at four overall, man. He just keeps popping up, doesn't he, Zinger? Yeah, I mean, nothing would surprise me. I'll, I'll just say that. I mean, he's he finished his season on a strong note, too, so that helps. And then we've got uh, Lenny Torres, Angels, young hopefuls here at 51. I think they got him overall. Angel, what do you think of that ranking? Yeah, I think he's going to continue to move up. He's had some good outings here at the end. He's got one more uh, before we wrap up. Um, he, so I think you're going to see him, you know, kind of move up into that top 30. Well, if you look at some of the scouting notes they have on there, it says for Lenny, there have been some good high school arms taken from the New York State. I guess talking about uh, Ian Anderson, he was the number three overall pick in 2016, Scott yeah. Blewett second round pick in 2014 so they're they're throwing him in in that group um uh, he's a standout from beacon high school Torres put his name uh, more firmly on the radar with sh uh, strong showings at perfect game national uh, the tournament of stars and by pitching in the perfect game all american classic game um i think going to talk about how he's sitting 93 it's been up 96, 97, which is kind of similar to Libby as well. Yeah. Um, just saying how he's young, 17. He uh, saying that he's starting to develop a slider that could be a future plus pitch and um, supposedly showed some change up, they said, in the bullpen that had some – that arm side run. Um, so, I mean, I think obviously it sounds like if he had a little bit more – time with these pitches and and some pitchability he might be even higher would you say that that that's that Absol would, that yeah, would be absolutely the case? yeah i think you know again starting here in the northeast we start off with you know lower pitch counts he's just starting to get the feel of his slider again he actually has a, a plus slider um i was last year he was using it and definitely was in that 84 86 range um with some command this year you know he's working through that trying to feel it again and get back into it um, he acts a, a very strong changeup. Uh, could definitely be a plus pitch as he continues to use it. As we know, a changeup is a field pitch. When you're at the high school level, um, not needing to throw an 84 mile an hour changeup to to kind of help the the player's uh, bat speed, the hitter's bat speed. So we haven't been able to go to. He hasn't been able to go to it as much. Um, his fastball about a, two weeks ago actually hit 99 on a few guns. Um, so that was a milestone wow. for us. Um, wow. <laughs> he's had so he's almost a hundred mile an hour guy. That's insane. Yeah, yeah. So uh, he's had quite a few, uh, quite a few 98s, some 97s, um, and he's probably throwing, I'd say, about 75 percent of his pitches in the 94, 95 range. Uh, his last few outings, so Started pretty exciting. Yeah. And then to talk about Libby and, and the comparison here, I think so. You're looking at. That was a scouting report for someone at the 51 overall. Here's someone at the four overall. And you can definitely see a difference, but you see Lenny has 
similar potential. Mm -hmm. It said, uh, "It's I don't like how it starts this off with a zinger. What do you think? In an age when radar gun readings often rule the day, Libertor stood out on the summer showcase circuit more with his feel for pitching than plus velocity. Give me a break. Is 97 not plus velocity? <laughs> I think what, what that you- shows you, though, is how good the other pitches are. Yeah, <laughs> and how much he can use, like how much he can use them. The fastball is really, uh, obviously, still one of his best pitches. But I think at the next level, just like Angel was saying, his changeup is going to be phenomenal because, you know, at the high school level, eighty three, eighty four, which is about what it, he throws his. Same thing. That's that's like a heater. Um, now he used yeah. it against some good hitters um, and froze some guys on it. But you know, I think that. You know, the only reason they say that is because his his secondary stuff is so good. And, and, yeah, of course, I get it. They're they're showing that he this guy knows how to pitch. I mean, we Jack, talked about his... the same thing, and I saw that too, and I was laughing. Yeah, he says twelve shutout innings at eighteen U uh, U.S. national team. Uh, they obviously they put him up in the gold medal game against Korea, which he threw six scoreless innings. You know, I think. The same time too, you you got a, obviously a, a proven starting pitcher here as opposed to Lenny. I don't think you know Le, Lenny is as proven as a starting pitcher, but they they're saying that he has that potential. Would you, would you say that's the case, Angel? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. He's uh, like I said. I think in the mix of development, we um, we did some things to kind of prepare him to be a starting pitcher, but we used him in closer mentality roles that when he was 15. You. 16 U, and then last year he started, uh, you know, obviously with USA uh, at the tournament, at the tryouts. He was at more in a closer role. Um, this year we just went to the windup, um, so we got him in the windup. Um, kind of went away from it back when he was about 14 uh, to start really let, let, teaching him how to ride that back leg a little bit, which we did a little better from the stretch than uh, when he was uh, in the windup. He was kind of leaking so because he's such a fast switch uh, player or pitcher, I should say, we wanted to kind of get him to ride that back leg a little better. So we went to the stretch for the last two years, and then this year we just went into the windup. Um, so I think they will start seeing him as a, a, you know, having three solid pitches. He has a little a little bender we work on, but we really don't use it much. Um, we really wanted to work on his command of his slider and, and uh, you know, kind of get that change up mixed in whenever we could. So, yeah, so I, I, think, I think the you know, is there. I think he's he's young. Is he still seventeen? He's only seventeen. He won't turn eighteen till October fifteenth. So wow, he's the youngest crazy. kid in the draft. Yeah, which is crazy. That means he's technically Libby's almost a full year older than him in the lip. So it's like you know, give Lenny another full year of development, make him a starter, and yeah. you know, then he then he moves up as far as you know his value. But at the same time, too, I'm thinking that's got to look good to scouts. If yeah. if this kid winds up converting to being a good starter, then they look at, hey, man, he hasn't been putting a lot of innings on his arm, yep. you know, his in his young career. So, yeah, and that was you know one of the goals uh, we had going into this year. We really managed this pitch count, especially in the Northeast when you're starting out with 35 degree weather. Um, a lot of coaches don't understand that. They don't want they want the kid out there 80 pitches starting March 15th. Um, and I really, you know, worked with the dad and, and the high school coach to kind of put a plan together to have him build. Um, he had his first 80 pitch game, uh, about a week and a half ago. He just threw his second 80, you know, 91 pitch in game. So we're building that on to be ready for, you know, for, for the last few weeks of, of the season here. Do you think he's going to go up higher? Yeah, he'll definitely go higher. We'll what what would you bet? I mean, am I putting you on the spot? What would you um, bet his, his draft I'm, I'm gonna spot? Get, I mean, I think he's going to hit the top 25. Um, you know, I don't know if he'll get up into the top 10. Maybe he'll squeeze in there. There's a few teams uh, up in that in that area that have some you know some interest. But, you know, it's hard to project. There's so many good pitches out there this year also. So, But I, I just imagine if he was – and if he was a year older, where do you think he'd be? Oh, he's definitely a top three pick, four pick. I mean, if Jeez. you compare him to Ian Anderson – uh, who was a, a fourth pick overall? You're looking at a kid that right now, velocity-wise, is stronger. Um, I would say breaking ball, balls are pretty comparable. I think Ian was more of a curveball guy. Uh, Lenny's more of a slider guy. So when you compare them, you know, I think they would be. He would be right in that line. Um, but you know, I, I think again, he's uh, you know, our, our, as a 17 year old, still working on command and, and hitting those spots and doing what he has to do. So I think over the next. Uh, Few outings, I think, will hopefully open a few more eyes before he wraps up. 
they almost have to look at him like an international draftee coming up so yeah. young. Don't That's you think? what I was thinking too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is a big talk, obviously, from a lot of the, the teams. Is you know they like his age, obviously. Hey, why don't you move him to the Dominican? Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thought about that. <laughs> I'm sure you did. <laughs> Well, cool. Well, uh, so uh, Zinger, where are you projecting Libby? If if you're a betting man, well, I mean, the whole off season, the goal, you know, I think you you set those goals, but we've gone one one is the goal. Um, Obviously, anything around there is is phenomenal. I I'm biased, but I mean, he's left handed, his pitch ability, and then he's got a lot of room to grow yet. You know, he's He's only 18, so I think there's a uh, a lot of upside. I take him. I th- I, no, I think <laughs> yeah. you're right. I think I, I think it comes down to, um, you know, the the right team, and if that team's looking for a lefty pitcher, I think that's what it comes to. So there's a lot of there's a, a lot of luck here on the roll of the dice, but I think he has that potential. Yeah, and there's good. There's a like like Angel said. There's a lot of good arms in this year's draft. Um, you know, but I I know he's considered the top high school left-hander yep. everything that i've seen so that's awesome that's pretty cool so let's talk about how these guys were built i know we, we spent that time last podcast with zinger talking about libby so let's go into angel here angel like talk about the process and and kind of you know talk about how this is built around your approach for i mean let's let's first tell everybody where you are where, where's your facility uh i'm in uh, hudson valley new york so it's uh Fishkill, new york i'm about uh, 55 miles outside New York City. So a lot of the kids that you're pulling there are from what areas? Uh, we pull a lot from Dutchess County, some Westchester County. Um, we go up as far as um, uh, Sullivan County up to Kings, uh, up to Kingston. Uh, so we're probably like a 35 to 50 mile radius that we'll pull from. Um, so any, we're right in that. Any guys, okay. any guys coming outside of that that have heard about you? Um, not, not, we got a few Connecticut, uh, some Stanford kids, which are a little bit outside of that, um, that heard through, uh, you know, heard about us. So we're really, dem- you know, pretty much in that 50 mile radius. Cool. So you, you got all ages, right? Um, yes. you obviously took, how young was Lenny when you started with him? I actually started with Lenny at the age of third, the fall of his 13 new season. So he was about to turn 14, uh, when I took Lenny, uh, took Lenny on as, a, as one of my, uh, students. Cool. And you kind of, I remember that was, we've talked about this before, but that was right when we were, we were, you were working with me with the top velocity program to try to implement more of a velocity uh, programming to your, to your training approach. And obviously you've had success with that, right? Absolutely. Um, You know, again, I I think we've talked about it before and it definitely um, helped us get into that elite player division where we can now really work with some of the players on what it's going to take to to take to get to the level they want to whether it's a d1 player or professional level um i think uh teaming up with you and and again being around the guys like zing and hearing what everybody's doing has definitely helped uh us continue to grow you know in the instructional world or the development world i should say and you know and that's where you and zing are very much the same i mean i've always been a performance enhancement guy from the beginning i just love velocity and power um, you guys are a lot more well-rounded than I am. So Zinger, that's kind of similar to you, right? When when you came in and, and wanted to learn more of what I was doing, you really ha- you wanted to bring more velocity into your, your overall approach, right? Yeah, you know, and I just I think we really connected on the idea of the ground up, you know, especially Coach Fletcher, who was one of my mentors, and I know you you knew Fletch, and I think that that was such a common ground for me, you know, and the biggest. The biggest challenge that I had at the beginning and I wanted to get in firsthand was all the information that I had heard on Olympic lifting, you know, versus having no experience with Olympic lifting. So I definitely wanted to dive in there and experience that first myself, you know, and uh, it's still a, a good challenge to this day. As you know, we talk about it all the time, but the technical side of the Olympic lifts is is an art form, very similar to you know, pitching and throwing and hitting. Yes. And Angel, I know you haven't gone into that as much as Zinger. I think you have, you have your own 
strength coach or, or do you out you send them out yeah to a no guy? i have a i have a strength coach here uh lenny's uncle um is actually a strength coach so he actually does lenny but um we do have guys hired here um that do our strength training here for all our other athletes cool so uh, along those lines s- similar things here meaning you guys are very good at, at teaching all aspects of, of player development or specifically for I mean, for pitchers, I mean, obviously, Angel, you're doing it all as well, right. uh, or more than Zinger. Zinger's mostly just pitchers. You're doing position players as well. But talk about when when these kids come in, Angel, what do you do? Like, I know you're assessing them. Talk about your assessments, and then what, how do you put them into a kind of individualized kind of ranking for their training? Kind of talk about that process. Yeah, so we started about a year ago really getting into using the metrics um, to, to be able to start putting – you know, player specific development plans together. Um, and we're, we're seeing some great progress with that. Um, again, I was in test mode prior to that with a few guys just to see how it works. So basically we go ahead and go get out there pro style tryout with some, most of the stuff we do. Um, the one I talk to the most, we do the 60 yard dash, uh, but we get a 10 yard reading, a 30 yard reading and a 60 so that we can see whether we need to work on acceleration you know, what, what can we work on? We'll videotape your run so we can kind of hit that to start. Um, we do the five ten fives box drills to look at, you know, agility um, and some lateral jumps now. So we're kind of taking some of these numbers that, you know, kind of help us see how athletic a player is um, and then what we can do to start working on the athleticism first. Um, and then we get into, you know, how do you look as a shortstop? Do you have the quick hands that you need to play a D1 shortstop level? Arm strength obviously has been big. You know, we thought we have the 2X program that we incorporate into our uh, our, our defensive program, uh, which we've seen some great improvements there with players. Uh, our first year with that, we saw a kid go from 74 to 84, 85 consistently. Awesome. Um, that same player went from running a 7-4 to a 6-8 that same year. Um, so a lot of the explosive movements we worked on kind of helped them even on that side. So we've seen some great things come of it. And, you know, so we're basing a lot of it on that, um, and then taking those metrics and sitting and putting that player development plan together, looking at the intangibles, you know, going to watch the kid on field. Does he have the instincts for running? Is it, does he have a good read on a ball? Things like that. We'll, we'll actually give them gradings, put them in, into buckets of where they need to focus when it comes to that. Um, my coaches for my travel teams, if they're some of the kids in our program are from our travel teams, they will give me some, some information on how the player, you know, did during the season with some of these intangibles, which I think is something that, you know, in talking to a lot of the scouts nowadays, <coughs> being fortunate enough with Lenny being looked at by so much is one of the biggest things they're talking to is getting the kids to have a feel for the game again, um, and not being showcase driven. Um, so we use the numbers to, to really, hone in on what we need to do, and then we put that plan together, but we don't forget that those intangibles, that feel of the game needs to be also taught and trained. Yeah, that makes a good point. Anything you want to add to that, Zinger? Yeah, I mean, that's a very similar approach. We have we just started a summer development program, um, and I have a Terry Paul Reese and then Ty Jacobson are guys that are helping me out, but uh, Coach Poles is basically our – our, what would I say, our mentor of the program, as far, especially as far as the position players goes. You know, and I think that that's a lot of the big missing link I see nowadays, too, even with the pitcher-only guys, is that, you know, they don't realize that once you let go of the ball, you're another shortstop. Right. <laughs> you know, so I like, you know, even to take these pitchers through glove work, you know, how they're supposed to have proper glove work, how to apply a tag, how to pick the ball. You know, certain technique stuff that um, Coach Poles brings to the table that we just, I love, even for the pitchers. Yep. Uh, um, so I, I've kind of seen that same shift where I think it's gone from the showcase and the numbers and all that stuff. And then, you know, you got your old school guys, too, that are sitting there and they're saying, hey, what about this, this, and this? And, you know, it's kind of like we talked about the other day, Brent, where it's, it's everything. You know, if you're looking for the complete player, then they should be able to do, you know, every little piece of this, you know, and then, you know, making their weaknesses potentially new strengths, you know, and teaching them those skills. Yeah. Well, it's like, like, I think, Angel, you're saying that too. I mean, 
I think these kids they need to be developed as athletes first, and and a, an athlete can play all positions. I think seeing um, Shohei Otani just wake us all up to yeah. <laughs> once again, conventional wisdom is just a mess. Like you know this this thing of pitchers can't hit. I mean it's ridiculous. I mean this guy is. I mean, there should be more Shoei Otani's out there. But I think it's, I see someone like Lenny. I guarantee you Lenny could be one of the top shortstops in the country probably as well, don't right. you think? Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, he's very I athletic, so yep. And don't you do – you, do you bestow that mindset into the kids that come into your organization that, hey, guys, we want to be athletes here. We, we obviously want to be great pitchers and great shortstops, but we want to be able to do it all. Like, we want to be well-rounded. I think that's probably one of the, the biggest – challenges we had going into the travel scene about three years ago is we started recognizing that we lost sight of creating athletes you know get them on the field and they're just very robotic they're very you know instructional type you know load stop go right. um and we really feel you know seeing that we got to get back to getting that feel of the game the understanding that you have to be athletic and be able to play other positions and yeah, we'll narrow that down as you get a little older to, to get you the reps you need in a certain uh, position. But I, I think it's definitely been something that we, we need to do more of throughout uh, baseball. Uh, but definitely in our organization, we're working really hard towards getting there. Yeah, you know, my career, I mean, y'all guys talk about your careers too. Like, I always enjoyed um, having a position player come into the pitching staff, you know. Like, like just getting to work with Chris Medlin. Chris Medlin came – you know, in college was a shortstop and then converted to a pitcher. And he, he plays, you know, y'all know it too. Like middle infielders pitch very different than pitchers do. They pitch more like an infielder. I mean, like they, they, they're setting guys up. They're talking to their defense. They, they pitch very differently. And, and then, of course, when they field a ball, they, they look nothing like a pitcher at that point. But I think, you know, of course, you're going to have guys that are just – they're born to pitch, and then you're going to have guys that are good athletes. But I think everyone should be working for that, being more well-rounded and being more, like you said, the feel of the game, uh, you know, you know, looking at yourself as an infield as much as a pitcher. Don't you think that's a good mindset, Zinger? Absolutely. I always tell them that once the ball is gone, you're a shortstop. Yep. You know, and even uh, – you know, I, I like to laugh, but it's – you know, the lefties get to live the dream. How many left-handers want to play short? Yeah. You know, yeah. they never get to. So, you know, <laughs> go get it. <laughs> you tell them, hey, when you let go of the ball, you're a shortstop. You're just a little yeah. closer, you know. And uh, <laughs> Libby had a play the other night, and there was a picture uh, on some website I saw, and he was throwing almost from my slot because there was he jammed a guy real good, and it was like a swinging bunt, um, and it went towards the first base side, and he had to kind of throw it around the runner, you know. And he he jokingly said, you know. There was a movie back in the day with Angelina Jolie, and they would bend a bullet like they would shoot guns. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. And he goes, "It crossed my mind to throw a slider so I could throw it around." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm, pretty, "I'm pretty sure Brock, our first baseman, appreciates that you threw a fastball." Right. <laughs> it would have been priceless if he would have called it with his glove, slide yeah. it, and then throw it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's well, the aspect that we're talking about, you know, where. Yes, we want skills specific skills, you know, and fundamentals. But then on top of that, the athleticism <clears throat> piece, you know, I tend to see out here because in Arizona you can play a lot of games, you know. So I run into a lot of kids that are playing on team after team after team after team, and they never take a time for a training season, you know. So they continue to go out, same skill set. And they might get better at their baseball-specific stuff by getting the reps they need. But if they're not getting in the weight room and they're not doing the performance training stuff or the mental conditioning, they never really rise above, you know, where they were at. You know, they just get just a little bit better, if you will. You know, uh, so I agree with you totally on that, Zing. I think here in the Northeast, you would think that, oh, they must have a training season. There, there's teams going out to play in these domes now. It's January. Kids are out there on the mound throwing in a game. Um, totally lost sight of the development part. You need to, to improve your game. So we talk a lot to exactly what you said is you need to have an offseason because you need to – you can't fix things during a game, you know, uh, unless you, you, you already have it in you. So it's really important to come in and do these things so you can kind of – 
master your trade. Um, so we, we talk a lot about that off season workout period and training season. Um, I, I think you're right on, the, but seeing the same thing, even though you're in the, the warm weather state, we're, we're here in the Northeast, and we're still seeing kids playing baseball in November and December, which is crazy to me. Well, I think because they get the illusion that they're falling behind. You know, I came right. from Michigan, and yeah. it's the same thing where it's like, okay, yeah, we there's some indoor facilities there. But it wasn't necessarily that we were playing other sports because, yeah, we played some other sports, but it's more that the there was a cross-training going on. You know, and I – Growing up, it was like we had Bo Jackson and Deion Sanders and let's see, Brian, Brian Jordan. Jordan, right? Yeah, like <clears throat> these dudes that could play both sports at the professional level, which is amazing. Oh, yeah. But I think the problem that we run into now is a lot of times guys think that if they're baseball only, that they're going to lose out development wise versus playing other sports. But then if you look at the Dominican Republic, Tell me about that. You know, it's right. like it just happens to be their training as well as playing. Right. You know, they're doing everything. Well, it's, it's just playing games. Not to get into the social dynamics of this country, but, you know, this country revolves around money. And unfortunately, where something grows popular, money grows, and then it starts to change the, the culture. And, the, you know, the showcases are making money. They're changing the culture. The travel teams are making money. They're changing the culture. So travel teams are pushing for all year round because they want a paycheck all year round. Sure. Showcases are trying to pop up every chance they can get. So these kids are just sitting there going, wait, I got a showcase. Oh, and, and on the lines too, do, you know, we're making money doing development. So, you know, I'm going to throw ourselves in there. So it's like, well, okay, I got a showcase, but I got to develop. And then I got to play in this travel team. So I, you know, whatever. So the point is like, it really kind of kills the seasons. It kills the... That good off-season, preseason, linear progression, you know. So it's all over the place. And then the kids are going, wait, well, now i got to play another sport and do the same thing? Well, then they feel like they're missing out. You know, I get guys all the time that will come up to me and they're like, hey, I'm playing on a club team, da 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 what about this, this? And I'm so basically this summer we, we devised our program based around that because I know a majority of my guys are going to be playing some type of a club ball. Um, I do not at the time have club teams. Um, so we're just focusing on the training. We have Mondays through Thursdays, 8.30 in the morning till 11. And then we're doing our lifting in the evenings. Um, but basically allowing Friday, Saturday, Sundays for these guys that r insist on doing both, you know, but then obviously getting guys that will buy into the idea of, Hey, if you're going to train this hard, you need to recover too, you know, and that's a whole nother piece that I think gets left out where it's like, Guys will run themselves, you know, in the dirt, tired, but then they won't take the time to eat right or to sleep right. the right way or enough, you know. And I think that it's it's that whole holistic principle, like we were talking about the other day, Brent. Well, Angel, talk about yeah. since you, you you have teams, talk about how how do you work with the kids to to su survive and manage all this. Yeah, so I'll start first. You know, Lenny's been a great example for us because, one, the family trusted me and, and allowed me to direct a lot of what's going on. So we were avoiding these, you know, showcases and doing those things. And he's still, you know, let's call him top 50 right now because you don't need to do all of it. You just need to know what to do as a player. And I think that's the challenge that a lot of these organizations run into is they feel they have to do everything. Um, and you don't. You need to have your season. You need to have your competitive time of year with some type of league play. You need to mix in your tournaments. You got to mix in the right tournaments for your players. Um, and then when it comes to showcases, you need to hit maybe one or two a year for, for a kid to get a little exposure to some different types of schools. Uh, but, you know, Lenny was getting calls from all these teams, you know, and he was, uh, again, thank God he just said, no, nah, I'm good. I know what I have to get done. We shut him down in September. We got him his rest. We got him back into the gym in October. Um, so we've been able to follow the vision that Zing seems to have, you seem to have, and I have that. It's about develop, taking the time to develop and then get into the swing of the season. So we kind of do the same thing throughout our organization. We, we really try to focus on player development. And with that being said is we make sure that we have more practice time than games. Um, a lot of organizations... They'll go out and play 100 games for the year and maybe practice 10 times. Well, you know, we all know that in this game, it's about practice. It's about working on your uh, mastering your, your trade. 
So we try to spend more time in practices and play less. Um, so a, tra- a 16U team for me this year, uh, this summer will play between tournaments and league play, maybe somewhere about 50 games. But we're probably going to practice 75 to 100 times. We, we start practices in our springtime. Uh, on weekends and then during the week we'll practice twice three times a week so we'll hit practice time harder than than our uh, games because we want to spend more time doing that um, with the hopes that over the next few years we start seeing more and more prospects come through more more and more d1 players come through um, and that quality of baseball picking up so we, Which, we try to guide yeah. it a little different that's good I mean in, in every organization needs to do that I mean it's that's just one thing that I can't yell enough is that we need more practice. And I remember when we were – before I, I just pushed top velocity, we were, I was doing a guerrilla baseball academy at the same time, running some teams. And <clears throat> I didn't want to do the teams at all. For, I mean, I just – I didn't have the desire. But I wound up doing it because we, we were running development classes for young kids in, locally in the area, which, like I said, I don't, even, I don't do that anymore. But And we weren't getting a response. Like, we were getting a really poor turnout, and we surveyed all these parents in the area. And all of them said, uh, we were like, well, why, why aren't you interested in player development for your kids? They're like, well, they're on, tr- they're on travel teams, and that's what the travel teams do. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no. <laughs> was like, that's why I'm offering this, because travel teams don't practice. Yep. And they were like, well, we don't, you know, we just, we, we, put it in those coaches' hands. We're expecting when our kids go to play for a travel team that they're being developed at the best, you know, that that organization they think they need to be developed. And then I realized I need to do travel teams. So right. I started doing travel teams, and that's what I was doing. I was practicing more than I was playing. So I, I get it, man, and, and I'm glad you're saying that because that needs to be the norm. Like, we really, really need to push harder for that. We need to get away from this play, play, play mentality because that's why we have so much injury, so much Tommy John coming up to these, you know, popping up with all these rookies in minor league ball. I mean, don't you think, Singer? Yeah, and if you go to these showcases, I think a big misconception is that these kids think because they go to a showcase and there's coaches there that they're going to see them. You know, those coaches are going to see guys that have certain skills. That's why we assess. That's why we let guys know where they're at. So I don't go into the perfect game tournament throwing 83 miles an hour thinking – LSU is going to give me a call after the game because they were there and they saw me pitch, you know, and it's like, no, it just, that's not the way it works, you know? And I think that, you know, the more and more we can practice, especially certain situations, you know, we like to take them almost like a spring training, you know, put guys on second and third, you got one out, tell the pitcher, Hey, you know, stop them from scoring. Tell the hitter, Hey, get them in. You know, and like allow them to compete at that level where, you know, a lot of times when these kids go and play in these games, I'll talk to, let's say, a center fielder who just played 14 tournament games. And I ask him, well, how many balls did you catch? And he's like, I got two balls, you know, and it's like and you're there for a showcase for a college. You know, it's tough to get that, you know, baseball is a game where opportunities just come when they come. You know, some guys look good because somebody hit them a ball. Right. You know, and certain <laughs> things happen that it's, you know, right place, right time kind of thing. But if you're out there just playing games, waiting for that right time and never putting in the training, you know, it, they're going to watch and they're just, you know, what, what's the NP, right? Not non prospect. You know, you see the NP come up and it's, it's over after that for a lot of the guys, you know, unless they're willing to buy into improving their measurable athleticism. I think that's what the Dominican Republic, uh, you know, uh, international ball has over the uh, American ball is that they spend less time playing games, showcasing, they spend more time in a practice environment. So they're getting the reps that they are getting compared to the American baseball player is probably 10 times the amount. Well, in the cross-training aspect, I've talked to a lot of guys, um, played with a lot of guys, but they wouldn't let guys on the baseball field until they had a certain time on the track. Right. Meaning they knew speed was obviously one of the five tools, and without that skill, you're not coming out there. So there's certain – I think uh, obviously there's a balance with that. You know, different guys are going to have different stuff, but – 
you get better at what you work on. I think all three of us probably can attest to that where, you know, if you bring a guy in, Angel, and you're you're putting him through your your sixties and you're you're doing their ten burst and their thirty burst and all that fun stuff, and and you're taking a guy from what'd you say from a seven four to a six eight? Yep. I mean, how much is that going to change that kid's life now when he goes and walks out in front of a college coach and now he runs that versus if he had still been that 7'4", you know, right. if you're not under a 7, you're not making it out of a pro-style workout. Correct, yeah. And again, it's a perfect example. The kid went from probably being, you know, a D3 player, seeing maybe some money academically to, to now, you know, playing in a D2 school with uh, probably about 90% of his education now being paid. So, you know, it, and it was because we put the timing in the right area. And I think exactly what you said, Zing, is spending more time with the development and the practices is what's going to make the players, you know, uh, get to the level they want. I think I had a two-hour conversation with Coach Walton at Oklahoma State. Uh, he's the pitching coach from Oklahoma State. He's been around for a while, while Rob Walton. Yeah, brilliant guy. I've, I've, t- I've had a chance to talk with him too. <laughs> yeah, and, and we just we were having this exact conversation for two hours, and it was so cool. He said he takes all of his, his freshmen in, and he runs them through assessments, and if they don't evaluate at a certain level, he doesn't even let them practice. I was like, dude, just imagine if every college organization did that. We, we would change the culture of baseball. People would then actually start focusing on athleticism. Yep. Yeah, I love, I love that piece. So <clears throat> let's, Angel, talk about – give them the full run through. Like, so, of course, the people want to understand it to become Lenny. You know, this is the way the game works. Kids learn about Lenny. They learn about uh, Matthew Libertor, and they go, I want to be that guy. What do I got to do? So – Angel, sum it up. What do you got to do to be a Lenny Torres? Trust the process. <laughs> I think okay. the biggest thing we need parents and players to do is to trust the experience that we have in this game, um, the development part of it, and understand it by putting a good plan together and trusting that process will get you to the level you want. And I think the, the Torres family, uh, I will tell you, they trusted the process. Um, you know, many, fa- ma- many families out there with an arm like Lenny would have been sending him all over the world just to get the exposure. And who knows if he would have, uh, you know, would have been burnt he'd, out. He'd by have him. arm problems by now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So trusting the process, setting your goals, whether it's that D1, D2, finding the right academic you know, school for yourself, put a plan in place to get there. And then that next level for the kids that want that professional level, knowing that it takes that much more, though, to get that f- to that level. Um, I think if I, if I can get parents to trust the process and be able to show more of this development process that we all have going, I think we, we'd see a different culture in the game uh, and get away from the showcase baseball that's going on. All right. Well, give them some tangibles, too, like some specifics on, on Lenny, the things that he accomplished that really helped him move up the ladder. Like, you know, was it speed, strength, uh, motor control, you know, just the learning mechanics, uh, composure like give him some tangible some key things that y'all really built and developed that they got him there i think the biggest you know with lenny was um his explosiveness you know he had fast switch yeah he's quick body he's very quick but just learning how to explode with the legs utilize his legs better as a pitcher um i think that was kind of our first uh focus with him was getting him to understand the movements that come with that fast switch and how to you know again control that so I think we hit that up uh, probably the most in the beginning um, from a mentality standpoint, starting to understand um, how to keep your composure. You know, again, at 13, 14 years old, you know, he, he would at times not have that composure. And as he got older, it looks like, you know, I, ice is running through veins. Nothing bothers him now. He, he understood he had to change uh, that approach um, and understand that this game is, is a, it's not an easy game. So we got to learn to fail before we succeed. Um, so I think the mental approach was a, a big piece with him. Um, so I, I think, you know, and then we put the game plan together for, you know, how much weight to put on each year, you know, how much we were looking for at the end of the season. Where did we start? What did we end it at? Um, his strength coach and I spoke about those things and, 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 you know, really built them from that end. So I think we took a lot of good steps to, to get him where he wanted to be, which is now in the top 50 in the country uh, for the draft. Awesome. All right. Zinger, what about Libertor? What does it take to, 
to build a Matthew Libertor? You know, I think the most, uh, I guess, what would I say? The most important aspect, I think, along with trusting the process, because I think that's, you stole the words right out of my mouth there, but literally having a plan and working your plan, you know, with with Matthew's dad, with his with his mom, with his parents, with everybody involved with him, we've we've had a plan for the whole year that it, you know it's the same thing. We built in rest time, we built in a training season, we built in a preseason throwing. We got off the mound, we faced hitters, and then we went into competition. You know there was there was a system in place for him. You know, and each guy's system might be a little bit different. You know, but I think as long as you have a plan and you work your plan, uh, good things can happen. You know, I think as far as for the kids out there, um, dedication, consistency, showing up. Um, I had Matthew talk the other night to my guys that I was training um, about their homework. So I always like to give guys some homework. You know, go home, get in front of a mirror, do this, this, or this, or do your visualization or your mental prep. And I asked him, I said, hey, how many days a week did you do this? You know, and he tells the kids every day, you know, how much time? You know, it may vary from 10 to 30 minutes to maybe two hours on a day where he's going to work on his own, no other coaches, right? Um, when you talked about turning points, I think some of the big turning points for Libby were with his nutrition um, and then just the mental game stuff where he started to really – instead of kind of hoping for a good outing or wishing for a good outing, he would see the good outing before he went out and did it. You know, the, the days before, the night before, the day of, you know, having that continual highlight reel just playing through your mind, you know, seeing your pitches exploding through the mitt and doing, you know, the things that you like them to do, you know, seeing your, especially when you're working on, let's say you want to be a four pitch guy like Matthew, you know, it's going to take work. You know, and you got to stay consistent and you got to, you know, continue to get a, just a little bit better every day. Yeah, man. And just talking to you guys and thinking back to my career, it's just amazing how much this game has gotten so much better. You know, it's it's not long. It's 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 really not the game anymore unless you're just a freak where you're going to be in the top draft pick just because uh, you're talented. You're going to be in the top you know top 10 rounds with top 20 rounds because you you built a plan and you're talented and you followed through you know there, there, there's a lot to the game now that I don't think people realize and I don't think enough of these parents realize if you really want to put your kid in the best position possible to live his dreams it takes a plan and, and that's that old saying by Napoleon if you fail to plan then you plan to fail so I think that's the best thing we should come out of this, guys, is that they, they need more mentors like us that can give them the plans and help them follow through and have success with it, right? I agree. Cool. I think it's a good place to end it, right? Right on. Sounds good. Any, any last words from you guys? No, I think I'm good, Brian. Again, thank you for having, us on, having me on. Cool. Um, uh, just go through, Angel, where they can find you if they want to reach out to you. Uh, extra inning, uh, excuse me, extra innings dash wappinger.com is one of our sites. Um, they could also find me on the cadets baseball academy.com website. Um, again, just here in the Hudson Valley in Hudson Valley, New York. And I hope to come up there soon, man. Yeah, we'll get you up here <laughs> for this fall. Yeah, I want to maybe, Zinger, maybe you can come with me. Heck yeah, I'm ready That'd to go. On the story. Let's do it. Yeah. yeah, all right, Zinger, tell them where they can find you. You guys can find me at coachzinger.com or on the Instagram world, the Coach Zinger app, and on Twitter, Zinger29. Um, and I guess just kind of my, my final words for the day as far as for other guys that are out there that are looking, you know, tap into resources. You know, use guys like Brent. Brent's been very helpful for me uh, in this whole process, whether it's I just want to shoot an idea and talk to them or, you know, whether it's all the way down to programming, how we're going to program guys, you know, in season versus out of season, how, you know, just different stuff. I think it helps, you know, as, as a mastermind to work together. You know, I think there's so much ego in this game where guys think they have 
everything figured out or if they tell other people what they know, people are going to figure out that they really don't know anything or maybe they do or whatever. But I think, I think if you can allow yourself to learn from other guys who are doing this stuff, uh, there's, there's a lot of, gr- of room for growth in your programs. And, you know, I think it's the best thing for athletes, you know, and even as third party validation, there might be something that I already think, you know, and I asked Brent, and then he gives, or here I am talking to you, but here I ask you and you give me these answers. And then when I bounce that back to my guys, even though they heard me say it before, now they have a new found belief in it because, oh yeah, well, Brent thinks that too, you know? And it's like, I think you can use that third party validation for guys to buy in. You know, I, I get coaches all the time that ask, how do you get a kid to focus on, on doing a program enough like Libby? You know, and it's like, because that's the thing I talk about is his focus and dedication um, that's got him where he's at. But it's like, to, in order to get that out of your athletes, you have to do that yourself. If you expect your athletes to learn, you need to learn. If you want your athletes to be humble, you need to be humble. You know, just practice what you preach, walk your walk. We've all heard it before. But if you expect your guys to learn from you, you should be open to learning from other guys who are you know, out there doing it. Exactly, man. I mean, that's why I wanted you three guys on here. I mean, think about it. These are three heads that are responsible for, you know, right now, two top round draft picks and potentially another slew of guys that we've worked with. Um, so, I mean, there, there's a ton of knowledge here that I hope everyone is uh, appreciating and, and also the reaching out to reach out to these guys. Both all of us here are very open to, to speak to anybody. So reach out to us and, um, and we're covering West Coast, East Coast, and the South. Can't beat that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so we're covering the United States. All right, guys. Well, that was awesome. I appreciate it. I'm going to end it right now. Uh, thanks for being on the show, guys. Thank you. Thank you.